to another edition of Fantasy Dream Homes, and today we're headed to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and we're going to stop here pretty quickly right there is Santa Fe, so let's back up just a little bit. So here you have the state of Texas over here. This is our New Mexico uh, outline of the state, and it sits right at the southernmost tip of the Rocky Mountain Range and the specific area of the Rockies, this is called the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. It's just an area of the Rockies and the Rockies are quite large, but people don't realize how big they are. We're gonna go up here and show you how big they are. So they start in Northern British Columbia, which is way up here in Canada. And right in here, this is the Liard uh, River Basin and it's they start from right here and they have the rockies the northern rockies they head down like this in through uh, alberta and into montana and you saw that brief highlight i wish i could make that stick there it is i don't know how you how you make that stick but anyway keeps coming they keep coming down here into wyoming down into colorado and they finish off just south of Santa Fe. So the Sangre de Cristo Mountains is the area, I believe this area of the Rocky Mountains right here. This is the front range right here. Well, let's see if I can get that to highlight a little bit. Uh, yeah, that's the front range area. So this would be the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. It's all part of the Rocky Mountain Range. Huge, absolutely huge mountain range. It's interesting if you're driving across, if you want to see dramatic change, drive across Nebraska. And this is some of the flattest road in the country. Uh, same with, um, let me just straighten this out a little bit here. Same with when you get into Illinois, it's really super flat in here, nothing but cornfields. Same when you're coming this way. The interstate follows the Platte River and it curves along with the Platte River. But they literally could have made a straight road here because it's nothing but flat road. And the rumor has it that they intentionally put turns in, gentle turns about every two miles. So turn, slight turn to the south, then the most slight turn to the north, and two more miles, slight, slight turn to the south, and then two more miles, slight turn to the north. So that people wouldn't fall asleep because you could drive for literally for hours without having a single turn. So just, uh, I don't know, trigger or whatever. Okay, so Santa Fe, we're gonna zoom in here a little bit closer here. Opposite, there we go. It's gonna come in a little bit closer. It was settled sometime around 900 CE Common Era, and it was um, settled by the Tanoan peoples, the indigenous peoples who lived uh, in numerous Pueblo villages along the Rio Grande River. The Spaniards came in around 1598 and colonized the territory. And in 1610, New Mexico's second Spanish governor, Don Pedro de Peralta, founded the new capital city of the state of New Mexico, making it the oldest state capital in the United States. So it's a smaller city of nearly 68,000 people. It's renowned for its Pueblo-style architecture. We're going to get into that in a minute. And it's a, a creative, uh, artistically creative uh, city. Now, before I forget, today's tourism site is santafe.org. And just like we always do, we try to feature the local tourist uh, information so if you want to go dining or shopping or places to stay, you'll go to santafe.org, and I'm sure they can steer you in the right direction. What we're going to be seeing in Fantasy Dream Homes here is uh, a lot of the homes we're going to see will have characteristics of what's called the Pueblo-style architecture or Pueblo revival style. Now, I'm going to show you a picture here. Let me just expand this screen here. So this is what you're looking at when we talk about Pueblo-style architecture. So what are we seeing when we see the Pueblo-style of architecture? Well, 
it's it's going to be a regional style of the southwestern United States, which it draws its inspiration from the Pueblos and the Spanish missions in Mexico. And by the way, if you hear some pounding right now, I apologize. There's some bricklayers working in our building, and I had to get this video out. I wasn't going to be, I don't, it might be going on for several days, so my apologies. But anyway, the style developed at the beginning of the 20th century and reached its greatest popularity in the 1920s and the 1930s. And though it's still, it's commonly used for buildings, a Pueblo style architecture is most prevalent in the state of New Mexico, which is where we're at today. So what are the features of Pueblo style architectures? Well, it Im Im imitates the appearance of traditional Pueblo adobe construction Though other materials such as brick or concrete are often substituted, if adobe is not used, rounded corners, irregular parapets, and thick battered walls are used to simulate it. Walls are usually stuccoed and painted in earth tones. Roofs are always flat. Common features of the Pueblo Revival style include projecting wooden roof beams or vigas, which sometimes serve no structural purpose, um, corbels. And I, before, I just wanted to show you, we have an image of corbels here, uh, corbels. So, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. See these wooden structures? They're not necessarily there. They're more of a look right here, corbels. And that's what you will see in Adobe style architecture. And so we see in the Pueblo Revival style, including projected, projecting wooden roof beams or vigas, which that's what we see here, these vigas. They, they're really more for a look. They don't really serve any structural purpose. Corbels, uh, curved, often wood-style beam supports, and uh, latillas, which are peeled branches or strips of wood laid across the tops of vigas, which are wooden beams to create a foundation, usually supporting dirt or clay for a roof. So I also have a picture of those. So these are the latias and these are the vigas, the beams. Okay, so what does the English, English Anglicized, I don't know if that's a word, but for that is uh, laths. And lath and plaster are what you see in a lot of older homes in construction all over North America. And it's, and I'm just going to read it straight out of, because I can't do any better than Wikipedia, is a building process. Lath and plaster is a building process used to finish mainly interior dividing walls and ceilings. It consists of narrow strips, like you see, of wood laths, which are nailed horizontally across the wall studs or ceiling joists and then coated in plaster. The technique derives from an earlier, more primitive process called waddle and daub, and we'll get to that in a minute. In Canada and the United States, the laths were generally sawn, but in the United Kingdom and, the, and its colonies, riven or split hardwood laths of random lengths and sizes were often used. Splitting the timber along its grain greatly improved strength and durability. In some areas of the UK, reed mat was also used as a lath. Lath and plaster largely fell out of favor in the UK after the introduction of plasterboard in the 1930s. In Canada and the United States, it remained in use until drywall began to replace the process in the 1950s. So you'll see this lath and plaster in a lot of really older homes. In homes I'm talking about, here in the United States and Canada that were built in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Now, there's a close-up of the lath and plaster, and this is wattle and daub. And this was a composite building method used for making walls and buildings in which a woven light lattice of wooden strips called wattle is daubed with a sticky material usually made for, of some combination of wet soil, clay, sand, and animal dung, and straw. Wall and daub 
has been used for at least 6,000 years is still an important construction method in many parts of the world. Many historic buildings include wattle and daub construction and the technique is becoming popular again in more developed areas as a low impact sustainable building technique. So right there we see a lot of relation in the building process of wattle and daub to lath and plaster and then to the uh, Ladia and Viga beams, the Ladia um, pieces of st stripped wood that you see in Pueblo style architecture. Okay, so that was just some interesting uh, construction information. And when we look at Santa Fe, there's one other thing I want to talk about, and that is the weather. And, you know, as any desert climate, you would expect that it's going to be hot in the summers, which it certainly is. But here's one thing of particular note that I want to point out. So let's take the hottest month, with is typically in the Northern Hemisphere is June and July are going to be hot. J July specifically, your very hottest month. Now, when you look at the average high, 85.9 or 29.9 Celsius. And watch that drop from the average high to the average low. And that's in the same day. You've got these huge 30-point swings in temperature. 30-point swing, 30-point swing, 30-point swing. And with a 30-point swing, it means that if you've been sitting around through the day in these hot temperatures and all of a sudden at night it drops that far in the night, you're gonna be cold. And that's why you are gonna see in all these homes, they're gonna have one or several fireplaces. Uh, I think one of them had seven fireplaces in the home because it gets really chilly at night in the desert. And you're gonna wanna put on sweaters and light the fireplace at night, in, even in the summer in the desert. So. Okay, so today's real estate site is going to be Sotheby's International Realty. We like to use Sotheby's because they have great big pictures, bigger than most uh, real estate websites, and they have beautiful pictures, typically. They use professional photographers. Why can't more websites, uh, real estate websites, be like Sotheby's? So it's Sotheby'sHomes.com. That will be in the show notes, as always. Okay, so our first home uh, featured by Sotheby's Real Estate. It was designed, and it says right here in the description, a masterpiece by award-winning Woods Design Builders. And they, we always like to give credit to architects and to interior design designers and to interior decorators and to engineers and anybody else mentioned in the description. So here's one that was mentioned in the description, woodsbuilders.com, and they will be featured in the show notes as well. And you can check out their, we invite you to check out their portfolio of work. Uh, they, I did look at this earlier. There's some amazing work there. So please check out woodsbuilders.com. So this particular first home is going for $4.225 million. It's four bedrooms, five full bathrooms, one half bathroom. Interior space is about 8,600 square feet, sitting on about two and three quarter acres of land built in 2003, designed by Woods Design Builders. Let's check out this first fantasy dream home.
Okay, so our second fantasy dream home has four bedrooms, three full bathrooms, two half bathrooms. Interior space is sitting at about 7,600 square feet. Sits on lot size of over 63 acres. It's a big lot. And it was built in 1991. And... I don't know if you noticed, but if you look at our currency, we've added one currency, CHF, as in the Swiss franc, Swiss franc. So we'll be adding that to all of our currency conversions. So let's check out this next fantasy dream home.
All right, so our third fantasy dream home is going for $4.9 million. It's seven bedrooms, seven full bathrooms, one half bathroom. The interior space is at 13,400 square feet. It's a big one. Sitting on 10.34 acres of land built in 1920. The original house dates to the 1920s, but a new wing was designed by the architect. And we have her page right here. It's May, I, I don't know how to pronounce this, but I'm going to say it's Mason Architect and Engineers. And the real original architect who did the design was Mesa Batane, and I believe that's how you pronounce it. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing her name, but invite you to check out. We always try to give credit to architects and engineers who do uh, design work. And if they're listed, we'll talk about it. So let's check out this third fantasy dream home.
Our next fantasy dream home is going for $13.65 million. It has six bedrooms, five full bathrooms, two half bathrooms. Interior space is the largest yet at over almost pushing 14,000 square feet. City on 16 and a half acres of land built in 2006. Let's start this next fancy dream home tour.
Okay, so our fifth house is going for $12 million. It's four bedrooms, four full bathrooms, one half bathroom. Interior space, unknown. It's not listed in the listing, which is crazy. You've got to tell us how big the square footage is. That's got to be known in this country. Sitting on 1,500 acres of land. Built date, again, unknown. So let's check out this next fancy dream home. Okay, so our final fantasy dream home for the day is going for $9.25 million. It is five bedrooms, six full bathrooms, two half bathrooms, interior space of over 12,000 square feet, sitting on 216 acres of land. That's a ton of land. Built date unknown. Let's check out our next fantasy dream home.
Okay, so that wraps up another edition of Fantasy Dream Homes. We hope you liked it, and we hope you uh, please subscribe and become part of our community, and we hope you participate by leaving comments and sharing your opinions. And which Tell us which home you like, which ones you didn't like, and why you liked them, why you didn't like them. Also, you know, like, share, and subscribe, and become a patron on our Patreon page. It takes a lot of time and effort to make these videos. I wish we could make more, but, um, you know, there is the day job to worry about to, that really pays the bill. This doesn't pay the bills at all, but your support sure would help. And we hope you tune in next time. So like always, keep smiling, everybody. And we'll see you on the next time here on Fantasy Dream Homes. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>